Gabby Soma was in the video was here. Um, Gabby, where are you? Here. <laughs> Sean, Sean Barn, Brett Badendike, Kenny Wojciechowski, Rob Adden. Uh, I know I'm missing a ton of people. Uh, I know the high school staff was there. Um, Gabby, who am I missing? I know you now. Dave McNally, John Carlo, Kirk Scoglin. Um, but we were just very fortunate to be part of it. And it's going to be used statewide. So if a school district is fighting for their programs, this video can be shown at numerous sites. So thank you again. Thank you. I have a few more comments. They're not listed on the agenda, but the uh, comments that I have, I've received a number of questions from various teachers and uh, community members, both in Slopesburg and, and then all throughout the, the uh, district. And they've asked me the questions and I thought, what better forum where we have uh, quite a number of people here to give you the information firsthand and, and directly. And one of the, the questions that uh, I've received, I guess, a number of times from a number of different people regards the closing of a school. And I wanted to tell you definitively, there are no plans to close a school, no plans to close Slowsburg. That's the one that I've heard the most about closing. Montebello was a close second. And uh, there's no plans for me to recommend nor for the board to adopt such a plan to close the school. Sure, Marlboro is closing one or two, maybe Katona Lewisboro is closing one, but Ramapo Central, we are not closing a school, period. second item, which will be an action item for the board, discusses the budget calendar for the spring. And the first budget workshop will be February 4th, the next board meeting. And the, just to give you a preview of the budget without getting into the, any details, the proposed budget that I plan to present to the board on uh, that Tuesday, and granted, next Tuesday the governor's supposed to give us information, and then late March, early April, we'll get the, uh, the final numbers from the legislators. But in this proposal, or the plan that, that I plan to present to the board, has no proposed reductions in staff at all. It will, the, uh, the combination, or to get to, the, to close the deficit, will be a combination of reductions in budget lines, not school lines, budget lines, central office lines, and use of reserves. So in terms of programmatic reductions, there will be no programmatic reductions. That's curricular and co-curricular activities. And uh, the only possible reduction, I hate to even include that, is if we only have 100 kids that come into kindergarten next year, okay? If you have 100 kids and you've got 25 teachers, you don't need 25 teachers, okay? So if there's only 100 kids, there may be a reduction there. But there are no other proposed reductions in staff, nothing programmatically, nothing with the curriculum, nothing co-curriculum. I hope I'm being clear on that, but the details will be fleshed out beginning at the board meeting in February. Okay. And the third item that I've had a lot of questions about concerns um, opening up union contracts. I don't have the authority to do that. I'm not asking for that. Um, the school board and the school district will honor those contracts. Uh, I think it's 
Patty here, but I think they're what, about 15 more months is when they expire. 17 more months till they expire. So there's there's no reductions in in anything as it relates to contractual information for all the seven bargaining units for the 14-15 school year, the, the, the one that we're developing the budget for. So no school closings, no programmatic reductions, and no changes to the contract. That's subject of negotiation when, when we get to it. Okay, so hopefully I've, I've answered some of those questions. I know I've gotten a number of them, uh, quite a few over the holiday break, and then uh, quite a few since I've come back. And as I did last spring, when it comes to the budget, uh, there are some parents in here that I've recognized. They've sent me a number of questions. Um, please continue to send those questions. And as we did with the budget development workshops, uh, we take FAQs, the frequently asked questions, and we'll try to, to get a response to you in that fashion so everybody can see it. We are working on our website so that there's a lot more information in the business, coming out of the business office and HR, a lot more information so that, that people can take a look at it and, and hopefully that will uh, quell some rumors and then please feel free to email or call. Calling's not the best because I'm in and out of the office, but please email and either I or somebody will get back to you. And I've probably spoken too long, Mr. Wong. So I pass the mic to you. I'm sorry, we only have one microphone, but uh, we're trying to get out and move the board meetings into the different buildings and uh, have an opportunity to get into the various buildings. Okay. The next meeting, the first meeting in February, will be at Montebello Elementary. Montebello. So hopefully, I see all of you there at Montebello in three weeks. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, for those of you following along with the agenda, you can see that it is the public participation on the action items only. So we do have the public participation portion later on in the agenda where you can speak about anything. But this is an opportunity for you to speak on the action items, which you can see is 2.01, all the way to 2.1. And these are action items that the board will be voting on. So if there's an issue up there that someone would like to bring to the board's attention, now's the time to do it, to approach the podium. Again, just as a reminder, since I do see some new faces in here, just so people understand the protocol with respect to public participation, where it's really public comment. We don't engage in a discourse back and forth. It's an opportunity for members of the public to make a statement the board will take that under advisement. So here's an opportunity before the board considers to vote on these items. So we would like to move forward. long-term success, not short-term at all. So 
So I'd like to um, endorse that from a public perspective, and I hope the board considers it. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Um, is my voice kind of loud? Yeah. Well, here you Okay, so as a result, what I would like to use is a consent agenda. Is there any particular item that anybody wants to pull? What I'd like to do is to get a motion in a second and then we'll have a discussion. But I just want to make sure there wasn't any action item that any board member specifically on support for. That's not the case. Okay. So we can have a motion for by Mr. Lotto, seconded by Mrs. Monaghan. Okay, discussion.
So funding the tax surgery reserve is really making an educated judgment that is designed to, to pr protect the district on the possible potential impact of a claim coming up. It's its ability to set aside sufficient funds so, so as not to increase the burden on the taxpayer uh, more substantially than is currently taking place. This has happened in the county in a couple districts. Uh, I'll point out an example in Clarkstown, where they won't. Uh, they just had a tax surgery claim of $13 million. But fortunately enough, they had $14 million in their tax surgery reserve, so they had those funds uh, to allocate towards that payment. Okay. So it's setting aside the funds for a potential claim. It's protecting the taxpayers, it's protecting the district. Thank you. 
throughout the whole year with our monthly, monthly treasury reports. We, we review the current tax surgery claims that are still open, that's still available. Uh, we meet with the town assessor to review uh, any potential claims coming forward. Continue to evaluate if that if that amount is still viable, it's still um, on the books as a possible potential claim. Uh, that's something we keep rolling forward. Now we meet with the tax assessor on a yearly basis at the end of the year to go over the funds that are in there to see if we're adequately for, uh, adequately covered for any potential claims. So when you when you meet with them, are you going over everything that's in there? And reevaluating, so I know you have to reevaluate on the first day of the fourth year and what have you, but are we reevaluating before that term, that time is up to make sure we're still on par with where it should be? Yes. The question was, was in reference to the evaluation process and when that takes place. Um, yes, it is a continual process. Again, with the monthly treasury reports, we look at our reserves on a monthly basis um, to see where they are. But it is constant. The time assessor prepares a report for us in detail with him on um, claims by per year um, throughout the entire year, but for the majority at the end of the year. Okay. Just the, the reason that the amount, you know, if it's a five hundred thousand dollar claim, you know, how do you determine really like do you just talk to does he give you any does somebody else outside the district give you any input <laughs> as far as what what the actual amount should be? Because the state's not saying it, our auditors not really saying too much about it, but what is there anybody else that gives us any more input, or we just left our own report to say what we believe is reasonable for that assessment or that survey? Yes, again, there, there's no guidance from the controller um, or the state as to how much should be allocated towards a potential claim. Um, again, it's a, it's a unique process to each claim, so we, we have to evaluate how much we feel could potentially settle. Um, and we do that with our, so our time assessor. Treasurer, the other people that can help us to determine how much that amount is. Um, so again, it's, a, it's an individual process for cert certification. There's no exact science. It's more like it, it's not an exact science to determine the amount that should be allocated toward the potential claim. Because you, there's, a, there's a potential that they could receive a 100% reduction with their request. Um, just, um, the amount of money that's in there, that comes 
that generally in August? Because that reflects the current tax <laughs> that, that That's the slide that comes out generally in August. And that's with the current, that year's tax rate. Correct. Like I said, the majority of the tax rates come in July. So we're able to see what they will be in the future. Um, this is done at the same time when we're, we're finishing and close the books. We know what our expenses and revenues are. We have any left over for the other way. If we have a deficit, we use a reserve for that. To cover that deficit, that's what I'm This was done in August, middle of August. So for instance, with Clarkstown, where they have Absolutely, and, and that, that, that's that's the problem. Really, some of these, like the example you mentioned, cars now, they only have that million dollars for potential claims, and they could get a claim tomorrow for over a million dollars. That money has to come from something. You don't have a reserve. It's coming from your general fund budget. Kelly, if we don't have the money in the budget to pay the tax reserves, if we don't, if we don't have the money in the budget to pay the tax reserve, then what, what do we do? So is that when you bond that other districts have bonded to actually pay back taxes to pay their their money, correct? It's only the patients just like that. Okay. And I think that's been the case. For example, Clarkstown, I believe the town did actually bond out that. So that's something we're trying to avoid. You, know, you don't want to go out and bond an amount for 30 years. So I think that's unnecessary. Just as a reminder, we have the consent agenda is uh, 2.01 to 2.18. Motion to the second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, discussion items next. Um, at our last meeting, we did not have uh, the majority board. <laughs> it's fun to 
But um, my only other comment with that is when we when we open this up, that last time I think we put it on the website and we probably sent it through PTA. There was a few people that said they didn't get it. So perhaps we can put a connect an email out saying that we're looking for the um, you know the, the, the resume. Thank you. Um, so this way everybody is aware, and, and then we can set up another connected when the dates will be, so they'll be open interviews, so anybody would be able to come and see them, and um, we'll go from there. So, well, we need to set a date as to when we, when we need the resumes by. So when do we need the resumes by? Is that the Today is January 14th. Wait, how much time is it? We have to put this in the paper also, correct, Well, you sent the nose out. Right. Yeah.
Okay, so this report will be about people personnel services, and I'll begin with a little review of what we discussed in January. Can you all hear me? So what we discussed in Jan I'm sorry, in November was what people personnel services does. And we are basically all of the extra educational services, um, except for Gen Ed, that take place in the district. We wanted to talk a little bit tonight about the numbers, which students benefit from all these services. Obviously a service like guidance services, every student at one time or another in their career in Ramapo Central will participate in guidance services. So that's about 4,500 students, approximately. Medical and nursing services, again, every student would participate in acquired nursing services as well as they might visit the health office. So again, 4,500 students. More specialized medical and nursing services include medical and health plans that many of our students have. Right now, the exact number is approximately 223. So that is about 5% of our student population has some sort of medical or health plan to address needs they have in the school environment. RTI and AIS services are services that Pupil personnel and ASI, or the curriculum department, share together. AIS services are mandated by the state based on what you get on your state assessments. RTI services are determined at the building level. Both of those services do take place at the building level. However, pupil personnel service faculty, such as special ed teachers, guidance counselors, psychologists, social workers, speech language therapists, all participate in providing those services to students. Displaced student services are for students who have been displaced from their home. We currently have three students who fit that category here in Ramapo Central. They are allowed transportation to either from their new district of location back to their original district of residence, which is us, or transition or transportation in the opposite direction depending on what the student needs. Clinical and related services, again, can come under any of these categories in meeting a student's needs and are take, take place in pupil personnel. English language learner services are our ESL services. We currently have 125 students in that category, approximately 3% of the student population. 
A separate category that's not on this slide is 504 plans because they encompass all of these pupil personnel services. We currently have 200 non-students with 504 plans to meet their needs in the educational environment. That's about 5% of our population. And as we said in November, the big uh, part of pupil personnel that most people are aware of is special education. Right now, special education, we currently have 685 classified students, or about 15% of our population. <coughs> Combined with the 504 plans, that means we have approximately 20% of our students who have some sort of program modification, testing accommodation, or services to meet their needs in the educational environment. Let's talk about how we get these students to those services, because our goal is to look at each student individually and provide them with the service level that they need to meet their needs, without enabling the student, um, but providing them with the scaffolding they need. Initial CSC referrals over the past five years, as you can see, have gone down. Clearly, the 2013-2014 number only encompasses this first half of the year, so this will rise. But they have steadily gone down most likely to due to the fact that we are using the RTI model in our schools. Okay, I put together some slides that talk about what happens after a student is referred. Because like Dr. Adams, I frequently get questions about special education and referrals. The biggest question we get in special ed is, is anyone classified anymore? So we looked at the last five years' worth of data. As you can see from 2009 to 2010, and 2010 to 2011, approximately 45% of the students were found ineligible. Here, again, this adds up to 44%. This is a specialized category that no longer exists in New York State. It's eligible, no services, so they eventually would be ineligible. And 52% were classified, 49% in 2010, 2011. See as I go over the next few years that those numbers remain fairly constant. In 2011, 2012, 44% were found ineligible, 52% were classified. In 2012, 2013, 47 were found ineligible, 47%, 53% were, were classified. So far this year, and obviously this number is skewed. <coughs> Sorry, I woke up with cold this one. 73% of the referrals we receive, the students have been classified. That number is skewed, however, because we have transfers in over the summer who actually are initial referrals for our district, but are coming in with an existing IEP plan. So they basically are rolled over. We have found so far this year 15% ineligible. If you look at these numbers all together in the graphs, as you can see, and I'm a very visual learner, um, and visual is the best way to describe it. If you look at the turquoise, the turquoise is virtually the same size. Over the last five years, discounting this, that will adjust somewhat, and I can provide you with information on that at the end of the year. Over the last five years, the turquoise has remained virtually the same size, meaning we have classified the same percentage of the referrals we have received. If you look again, the red, on these three years is the same size. If you add this red and this orange, which are virtually the same category together, you can see that would also come to the same size, somewhere between 44 to 47%. So over the last five years, Gramercy Central School District has classified the same percentage of their students every year. Declassification of students. This has um, dropped considerably over the last few years. The students here were students that once um, the district started looking at their true needs, it was discovered that many of them did not need the level of services they were providing. So some of them were declassified and given 504 plans or some other sort of medical plan. Some of the students ended up with no services after that. These are the numbers of the students that were declassified most recently. This year to date, we have not declassified any students. That is primarily because it usually happens during the CSC season at annuals. So that starts in February. OK, 
okay, as I mentioned before, we've had a, quite, quite an uptick in our 504 plans. Many of our students who were sitting with IEPs at one point um, really needed more of a 504 plan. On a Section 504 plan, the difference between that and an IEP is it's not an individual instructional program. However, you do have program modifications, testing accommodations, and you may be getting some related services, such as speech language, OT, or PT. So we have had quite an uptick of those over the last five years. This is, again, in an effort to finesse and make sure that we're meeting students' needs at the level that they require. <coughs> students with special needs. As I mentioned before, we currently have 681. That is down approximately 70 students from 2011-2012. You can see the trend. These are the classifications where they primarily sit. In New York State, there are 13 classifications. These five are the ones that are used most frequently. Many of the medical classifications fall under all others, and as you can see, that's for some, um, it's definitely one of our lower categories. <coughs> the students who, um, of, of the 70 students that we have got down, some of that is due to, obviously, graduation and the enrollment has decreased in the district as a whole, as well as students receiving 504 plans instead. <coughs> Where are all those students sitting? So now I have 681 students with disabilities. How am I meeting their needs? What programs are they in? 543 of them currently are in, in district programs. That means in our schools, in our district. 36 are in center-based FOCES programs. This is such as, it, you probably can't see that way in the back. Those are programs such as Jesse Kaplan School, Riverview High School, and CBI Tech. 45 of them are in BOCES district-based programs, such as in Lake Elementary School, South Orange Town Middle School, North Rockland High School, BOCES has programs in all of those buildings. 36 of them are in BOCES programs that are in our school buildings, such as Slotesburg, Montebello, Suffern High School. 21 of them are in private schools or consortium schools. These are schools that, such as St. Dominic's, New York School for the Deaf, Clearview, and Manuel High School, that specialized, a very specialized program that meet these students' needs. Okay, of our students at the elementary level, we have 52 students in resource room, 95 in integrated co-teaching, 35 in special class, those are the, the pull-out classes. The middle school, we've got 21 in resource room, 54 in integrated co-teaching, and 48 special class students. And those are cover all content areas. The same with the high school. All content areas are addressed. 57 are in resource room and skills and strategies. 68 in integrated co-teaching and 54 are in special classes. CPS, these are the little guys, the, the little preschoolers. I love it when they come into the meetings. So we currently have 64 CPSC students. As you can see over the past three years, this has gone down considerably as well. We get these referrals from outside agencies or the County of Rockland or DSS or parents at times. Often these are students that were initially in early intervention services. As they age out of that, they become CPSC. After CPSC, you age into our kindergarten program. Some of these students are in center-based programs. Some of these students receive only related services, and some get the work individually with a special education teacher. <laughs> this is a special category in Ramapo Central. We have parentally placed students in non-public schools. As you can see, currently, two of these students we are servicing in non-public schools that are in Ramapo Central School District are actually our residents. We also service 33 non-resident students who are sitting in these schools that sit in Ramapo Central. That would be Sacred Heart, Yeshiva Darkinom, Yeshiva Oruvin, Terrace, Terrace Basiakov, and Sterling East, which is a new one we had started last year. Five of four students, as we discussed before, we're at 209. Now you can really see how much we've moved students, or students have um, gotten Section 504 plans to meet their needs. Again, these students don't have individualized educational goals. They don't have individualized instruction, but they do have possible testing accommodations, 
program modifications, and related services on their um, plan. This number has gone up considerably. Student assessment eligibility. The number that really matters here is the 65. We have 65 students for our alternate assessment. They are in BOCES programs, private schools, consortium schools, and sitting in our building, various areas depending on their needs and which program would meet their needs. Alternate assessment students are students who do not take the general ed state assessment, so the ELA, the math, the regents exams. They are assessed using the portfolio method on very specialized, individualized goals. After they are assessed at the high school level, that's when they age out and they graduate. Okay. How many special educators do we have? We currently have 49. You can see the numbers have gone down on that category. They have gone down because we have had less students in the programs. OTs are five, speech pathologists is a seven, psychologists are eight, social workers are four, teaching assistants are at eight, and the aides are at this number. Okay, what does that mean for our services? At this point, we are still maintaining our level of services for all of our students. We are meeting every student's need, both mandated and non-mandated. So we're able to still do that RTI and that AIS that we need to do. We're able to do all those Section 504 plan related services, and we're able to make sure that we do all of the IEP services. What does this mean for the people that work here? On the whole, occupational therapists in this district have 23 students. Speech therapy addressed the needs of 48 students, psychologists address 30 students, and social workers address 30 students per um, faculty member. Our budget. So what's our budget look like? Well, the rest of the numbers went down. The budget should have went down. On top of that, you can see that the grant funding has gone down all three years. This funding is now non-existent. It did exist if I had a fourth column. You have this federal funding in there. It doesn't exist anymore. Next year, I'll have to take that one out. Hopefully, we'll get something new. I'm not very hopeful about that. Okay, so this, these are our total projected budgets for the three years. As you can see, and again, you might not be able to see that from the back of the room, the majority of the Google Personnel Services budget is dedicated to um, OSIS funding. What does this all mean? Okay, so now we went through all those numbers, we saw all those graphs, what does that all mean? Our trends over the last five years. Our CSC referrals have decreased, most likely due to the RTI process that we're using in the schools. Our CSE classification rate has been, <coughs> remained stable, as has the in, ineligible rate. Our declassification has decreased because many of the students who were classified with no services were, who actually needed a lower level of services, such as a Section 504 plan, have been moved to there. Again, obviously that means the number of Section 504 plan students has increased. And another number that has gone up quite a bit over the last three years is our non-resident, parentally placed, private students. That classification and that number of students, we are receiving referrals in that area almost every day. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? So on to this page. Just a couple pages back. Um, Yes, but we don't have listed the average number of students that PT and OT sees for the past two years. And I know that was because we talked about this last year also. Therapy is the 23, it's the first one. But the PT is not. OT is a different color. Okay, so I have a certain baseline. Okay, I'm sorry. I have a certain amount of computer skills, and then it like dies off. So, so getting that to be the same color for some reason I could not get. So the OT yeah, I'm sorry. is at the top, but the PT is not on. Okay. Right. Oh, so I can get the PT. The color for me. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> can, we get a, can we get a number yes, on the PT? Yes, we can get a yes. number. Probably by the end of the night. Thank you. Can I get a number by the end of the night? <laughs> you got that? Four? <laughs> it has increased over the last three years. I do know that. So okay. much. Thank you. When you talk about declassifying and going to a 504 plan, I well, just a question. That's because we're talking about the least restrictive environment for the kids. Correctly. Um, yes. Just 
okay, well, we're talking about declassifying students and then moving them to a different type of plan. Why would I do that? How does, how does that benefit, I think, is what you're asking. Yes, Mrs. Denson? Okay, so one of the tenets of special education, um, federally, is that we use the least restrictive environment, the least restrictive service that is possible to meet the student's needs. This means looking heavily at the student and examining exactly what their needs are, exactly what type of support they need, and providing only that support. If I'm providing more support than they need, I am actually impacting them possibly negatively. So declassifying students, moving them, let's say, to a 504 plan, moving them to a medical plan, moving them to just building level services and then the gen ed teachers kind of call the shots and the building administrator work with it is a way to meet their least restrictive environment needs. Now that's something I hold very dear to my heart because all of this legislation came out of um, Geraldo Rivera's Willowbrook and Letchworth. I worked at Letchworth when I was in high school. I saw things no one should ever see. So least restrictive environment to me is the most important piece of what we do for students. Giving them exactly what they need, not too much, not too little. And that, that's difficult. That's a judgment call we have to make at the table and then re-examine and re-examine the data and it's continuously. Very, and it's very individualized. It's extremely individualized. Because every student has different, different factors coming in, different, different things that occur, different ways that they learn. We all learn very differently and very individually, and all of that has to be judged, and then continue to be finessed throughout their school career. Um, two more questions? We can this. Yes. Um, just stay right here. Uh, I just want you to give an explanation of what an, a consortium class is. And then also, we talk about the non-resident students and just an explanation that the costs involved in that and how how that gets um, built back to the other districts. Okay, so Mrs. Danzig asked about consortium classes, which again, some ideas of consortium classes would be um, the classes that sit at North Rockland High School that North Rockland School District actually runs and we can place students in. There are classes at Nanuet, excuse me, middle school that run in conjunction with a BOSIS class that we can actually place a student in the Nanuet side and then they're in the consortium class. We have students placed at the TZ High School Code program in the consortium side, which is the side that South Orange Town School District runs rather than the BOSIS side. So these are specialized classes run by different school districts. So we're a consortium school di of school districts here in Rockland County. They're run by the different school districts. We can then pay tuition for our students to go there if that's the right class to meet their needs. So those are what those are. We don't have any consortium classes at the moment. Not at this moment. To the best of my knowledge, they did exist at one point, um, but we're one of those districts that it's diff difficult. We're not small enough and we're not big enough, so we always completely fill those classes, so we're really not able to open them up as consortium classes. Uh, the non-residents that are placed in non-public schools in Rockland Central, which actually be service, but the, the cost of that, how does that work? Yeah. Okay, so we service these students sitting in these buildings. The, the district of location has to do the evaluations, provide the services, send teachers there, or have the students come to our buildings. We do bus students to come to our buildings for these services. The district of residence, we then bill back for the services. So we bill back different districts. They are all, to the best of my knowledge, they're all Rockland County districts that students are then placed. So you might have, let's say, a North Rockland student sitting in Sacred Park. Sterling East has several Clarks County students sitting in. We're providing them services and then we bill back. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
expenditure. Again, this is a report on last year's expenditure. Expenditures of 12, 30, So if we look at the first slide, our, our, our both season residents.